When a nation becomes ill, what then? I teach history of Western political philosophy at Georgetown University, and the greatest books of Western civilization pertain to just this question. When you think about Plato's Republic, for example, Plato does not ask the question, which Joe Biden or Donald Trump will save Athenian democracy? He asks the question, has something terrible gone wrong in the souls of the Athenian citizens? Every great crisis in Western civilization has prompted a reconsideration of human nature, and we are in the midst of just that crisis right now. So I'd like to give a report from the trenches of Washington, D.C., from Georgetown in particular, where my students are frightened to death of being canceled. They're frightened to death of not being woke enough. They are scared to take risks. They are being taught in higher education two things, fear and guilt. Also in Washington, I encounter the elites from the left and the right, both of whom have become disconnected from their fellow citizens. On the left, you have identity politics, innocence signaling of luxury ideas that the masses do not need are probably hurtful to them. On the right, you have principled conservatism, which gave us free markets and offshoring of manufacturing jobs uh, to the detriment of our middle class. In short, both parties have become radically disconnected from the needs of its citizens. I'd also like to report from the trenches of the Woodson Center, where I'm a senior fellow. I work with Bob for several years now, and it strikes me that out of the Woodson Center comes the best ideas about how we can address the problem of race in America. We are all feeling it today. A general confusion, the sense that the foundational middle ground has been lost. I think this is occurring in three distinct senses. Politically, we have a left that is moving toward kind of cosmopolitan universalism that carries in its wake a commitment to identity politics. On the far right, there are rumblings of kind of reactionary blood and soil nationalism, less so in America, but certainly in Europe. Socially, we are seeing the disappearance of the middle as well. We are losing the mediating institutions about which Tocqueville wrote in Democracy in America, notably the family and the churches. Economically, we are also seeing the disappearance of the middle. America is committed to be a middle-class commercial republic, and in fact, we are losing that very quickly, and we must find some remedy to that problem. Our immediate problem, in my view, is that we're living in the midst of a third great revolutionary wave, an incomplete religion of identity politics promulgated by the new left, which follows the first wave, which was the French Revolution, and the second incomplete wave of religion, which was Marxism. Now, in fairness to the parishioners of identity politics, they are seeking to answer the deepest longings of the soul. They're asking the question, how can we bring about justice in a broken world? And it strikes me that conservatives have very little in the way of an answer to that question. This moment has, has brought us to a political crisis, uh, which in my view is more than a political crisis. It is a crisis of and within Christianity, as were the first two revolutionary waves. Compounding this crisis, there are developments on the right about which I worry as well, integralism and the flirtation with Nietzsche, which gave us blood and soil nationalism in the 20th century. Ahead, in my view, there are three distinct choices. We can return to what I have called elsewhere, the liberal politics of competence, where we engage each other in face-to-face -face relations. We look at each other as bearers of competence and as creatures who are seeking to evaluate ourselves on the basis of merit. And the third possibility is the anti-liberal politics of a re-enchanted world, which I worry a great deal about. On the well-established right, we have impotence today. There is a battle between economic liberals and cultural conservatives, and the NatCon movement, headed by Yoram Hazoni, of which I'm a part, has shifted the balance of power so that now the cultural conservatives at least have a voice in the way that they did not in the Reagan administration and onward. And yet, that optimism is not fully warranted because in my view, that conservative movement, the new conservative movement, has yet to fully figure out how to think through the problem of guilt. The problem of guilt in the West is the primordial problem that a politics of conservatism must be able to address or it will falter and fail. In the age of equality, guilt has now emerged as the central problem. 
The question I ask of my students and I ask of you is this, what would you do to lift the burden of guilt? Would you renounce your nation? Would you renounce your mediating institutions? Would you renounce your history? Would you renounce your monuments? We are all being tested, and in my view, our very future hangs on the question of whether we recover an understanding of the nature and source of man's guilt and in what consists atonement. Conservatives understand economic debt, and they understand the debt we owe to our fathers, but they can go no further, and that is the problem. They, in a word, cannot address the fundamental problem of guilt in the West. Now, on the left, there is a fundamental fixation on guilt, on spiritual debt, so to speak, that one group owes another because of its past transgressions. In America, we have slavery and its aftermath. We have the unpayable debt that whites ostensibly owe blacks. There is profound guilt. There is profound damage done by white guilt. Defund the police is easy when you live in distant zip codes. This also denies the guilt and responsibility among those who it deems innocent victims, which helps no one. In Europe, there is another problem. We have slavery. Europe has colonialism, World War I, World War II, and the Holocaust. Here too is unpayable debt, which white Europe owes the world. The European Union, in my view, is not an economic union. It is not an economic union on the way to being a political union. It is, in fact, a public atonement for past sins. It is a declaration by European elites that there will never be nations again because there is no way to atone for the guilt that those nations have produced. The American wound of slavery, the European wound of nationalism and its aftermath in the last several centuries, has left both groups in a position from which they cannot find a way out. They are both haunted by sin and guilt. They need to find some way to release the burden, and they cannot. There is, in fact, a daily Passover ritual that is occurring across both America and across Europe, and I don't think people involved in it understand in the slightest what they're doing. When you put a Black Lives Matter sign on your front lawn, you are announcing that social death is supposed to pass over your house. The same with putting green stickers on your car and various other signs in your front yard. There's a desperate attempt around the world now to purge guilt without any religious mechanism of doing so. And so what we do is we find a group that we think is guilty of stain and impurity and we vent our cathartic rage on them. We make them the scapegoat. This is no way to solve a problem the problem of guilt, only a return to the churches can allow us to do this. Let me say a bit more about identity politics here. First of all, we have to talk about the word identity. There's two ways in which the word is used. One is innocent and the other is not. If we mean by identity kind, then that is fine. We've simply added a new word to indicate something we've long understood, namely that there are different kinds of peoples. But that's not really how the word identity is being used today. Identity is being used to specify a relationship, a relationship between those who are pure and those who are stained. When you have an identity, you are positioning yourself on the great chain of being between pure and impure and finding a location where you can specify your superiority to others and what you yet owe to those who are higher up on the chain. The ones who are highest up on the chain have every right to speak. The ones who are lowest on the chain have no right to speak. Only the innocent victims are allowed to speak in this sort of moral economy. Now, transgression and innocence are theological categories. They come out of Christianity and are inconceivable without Christianity. The Christian idea is that there was one sufficient scapegoat who takes away the sins of the world. The problem of sin on the Christian understanding is so deep that God himself had to send himself into the world to save the world. Scapegoating this group or that group will not remove the sins of the world because the sin within us is original. It is always already there. No matter how much you scapegoat other groups, you will wake up the next morning and still be aware that you are a sinner. In the Christian account, the relationship between innocence and stain is vertical. That is to say, all mankind is guilty by virtue of inheriting stain from Adam, and Christ alone is the innocent victim who takes away the sins of the world. 
In the identity politics deformation of this understanding, innocence and stain are understood horizontally rather than vertically. That is, you, the innocent victim, can look out outward at another group and identify them as stained, in fact, as irredeemably stained. And in fact, that as a consequence, you can feel good about yourself. Identity politics knows that transgression and innocence are the central categories for us, and yet seeks an imminent rather than divine resolution to the problem. The left then offers you a way to lift the burden of your guilt. It is a simple formulation. You must renounce your nation, renounce your monuments, renounce your history, renounce your heteronormative families, your homophobic church, your patriarchal science and technology, and an Edenic homecoming is yours. The problem is that tens of millions of Americans and Europeans have fallen into this, just this delusion, just as tens of millions fell for the catastrophic ideologies of redemption in the form of Marxism a century ago. Identity politics proposes that you alone, your friends, your family, and your churches cannot help you lift your burdens. Your problems are so big that perhaps nothing can lift your burden, or if something can, only another great big state program can save you. Can it really be the case that the civil rights movement, which supposed that the heteronormative families and the churches that necessarily heal the wound of slavery, ends in the attack on the family and the churches we now witness in the name of being inclusive? The problem with identity politics is that a victim one day can become a transgressor the next day. There is no end to this. There is a never-ending search for new victims, and those who are innocent one day will always become the transgressors the next. The recent 2022 elections has confirmed the problems which I am indicating. Republicans thought that they were going to have a red wave, and they did so based on the issues. What they did not understand is that a vast swath of Americans are less concerned with the issues than they are with signaling who, in fact, are the innocent victims and how must they be protected. The Dobbs decision indicated for many Democrats that women were now again going to become innocent victims, and that is why the votes went in that direction. Until the conservative movement has a serious understanding of the crisis of guilt that is now upon America, until the conservative movement understands that more talk about free markets and even talk about what we owe to our fathers, the debt we owe to our fathers, will not touch the depth of the problem that identity politics is speaking to. Until all this happens, the conservatives will continue to lose elections. How then should we talk about race in America? Conservatives are right in this respect. Collective guilt will get us nowhere, nor will reparations. There is indeed a wound that still is the legacy of slavery, which we must overcome. And it will take hundreds of years to do this. This is the first thing we must understand. Second, we must understand that while collective guilt is not an option, local responsibility of the sort that Tocqueville probably would have had in mind is. The best model for us all to think about race is the one that Bob Woodson has put together over the last 40 years in the Woodson Center. There, he invokes the biblical distinction between Pharaoh and Joseph. His argument is the following. What we must do as members of our local communities is look around, find the quiet Josephs amongst us who are doing great good without any fanfare and approach them and say, how can I help you? Do not advertise this. Simply go and help them. Let them be the rainmakers they already are, and you stand back quietly. This is a wound that can only heal through long work. It is a deep wound we have in America, and conservatives will do well to stop pretending that we live in a post-racial society. When they do, they are accused of racism. They have nothing constructive to say, and for that reason, the left controls this narrative. I've characterized identity politics as a deformation of Christianity. Perhaps it's more appropriate to say it's a heresy within Christianity. What do I mean by this? Identity politics adopts three central categories from Christianity. The innocent victim, the scapegoat, and irredeemable stain. In the Christian understanding, all human beings are descendants of Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. Therefore, sin is always original in all of us because Adam is our father, so to speak. No matter what you try to do, no matter how well you educate, no matter how you organize your society, 
there will always be this problem of sin, which man cannot eliminate. What the Christian does with that is recognize that there is no human solution to the problem of sin. And the account that the Christians give is that there is a scapegoat who takes upon himself the sins of the world. The idea of the scapegoat goes back to the book of Leviticus. There you find in Leviticus an account of citizens putting their hands on a goat, releasing all of their own stains, putting them on the goat, and the goat is escorted out of the community so that the purity of the community can be restored. All human civilizations have had a scapegoating mechanism through which they can get rid of the impurities of the community. The Christian insight is that only a divine scapegoat can solve this problem because the stain of man is so deep it is original. That is why in Christianity it is called original sin. On the Christian account then, original sin is something that must be removed by a divine source. Christ is the divine source that removes that sin. He must become the scapegoat who takes away the sins of the world. These three fundamental insights of Christianity about irredeemable stain, about the innocent victim, and about the scapegoat are inverted in identity politics. It is a quasi-religious movement. This is why I have characterized it as the third great incomplete religion. The first was the French Revolution, the second was Marxism, and we have now entered a third great incomplete religion. It's the identity politics heresy that is now upon us. In identity politics, these three categories exist. Instead of original sin, we hear the term irredeemables or deplorables. These are people who are outside the pale of civilization. They cannot be redeemed. Their filth is so great that they must be outcasts. There is also the innocent victim. The idea of the innocent victim is incoherent without Christianity. In Christianity, there is one innocent, voiceless victim. It is Christ, and we must look to Christ to take away the sins of the world. In identity politics, there is no Christ. In identity politics, you have sin and transgression, but you have no forgiveness and you have no God. The innocent victim are women, gays, transgendered, blacks, people of color. The list goes on and on and on. There is no understanding of the universal guilt of human beings under identity politics. In point of fact, the world is separated between the innocent ones who have a right to speak and the transgressors who must now shut up. On the one hand, there are the irredeemables and the deplorables who are the transgressors who are full of stain. On the other hand, you have the innocent victims. And the whole purpose of politics now is to reconfigure the world, redistribute resources so that they all flow to the innocent victims and so that the transgressors, the deplorables, are pushed aside for this new moment of history in which the world can finally be redeemed and the stains can be purged from our midst. That is why the scapegoat is so important. You must purge toxic masculinity. You must purge the deplorables. If they win, there must be some other reason why they win, perhaps some other stain in the world, perhaps Russian collusion or something. It's simply impossible from the vantage point of identity politics to give any credence whatsoever to those who it renders as deplorable. We are in the midst of a profound crisis, and there are two antidotes. One is spiritual, and the other is sociological. On the spiritual realm, it should be clear to you by now that the only way to put identity politics to rest is to have a superior account of the problem of innocence and stain. And the only superior account that is out there is the Christian account. Part of the reason why we are in this mess in the first place is that the Christian churches, Protestant and Catholic, have faltered throughout the 20th century. They have lost sight of the importance of a moral economy of stain and transgression. They have expounded the God of love and they have lost sight of the God of judgment. Human beings need some understanding of judgment, of indictment, of stain, of purity, and how to find a way out of their mess. The problem is the churches no longer offer it. They offer only universal love. Therefore, the moral economy of purity and stain has moved out into the world of politics, into identity politics. And until we can bring that back into the churches, there will be no answer to our problems. 
The first antidote then is a revitalization of the churches. The second is a return to the Tocquevillian understanding of how we might have democratic liberty in the modern age. Tocqueville understood that there were two possibilities before us, equality of all in servitude or equality of all in freedom. If we wish to have that equality of all in freedom, we must defend our mediating institutions, the families, the churches, our civic associations, and our local governments. What do we learn in these? We learn how to build citizen competence. We learn how to rule and be ruled. We learn the meaning of self-interest rightly understood. We learn trust. We establish character and habits. We discover who we are. This is one of the great problems of identity politics. The precondition for us meeting under identity politics is that you affirm me and I affirm you. Nothing could be further from the truth if we want to build a world of liberty. We must engage each other and discover in the process of that engagement who we are, not announce prematurely who we think we are. In addition, through these mediating institutions, we ameliorate the problem of bipolarity. Tocqueville once wrote, in the democratic age, I fear someday, citizens will see themselves as greater than kings and less than men. He sees that this problem is not a biomedical problem. It is a psychosocial problem, which can only be ameliorated through these face-to-face -face associations. However, here is the problem. Identity politics wishes to destroy all those mediating institutions. The family that we so desperately need is accused of being heteronormative. The churches that we so desperately need are accused of being homophobic. Our local institutions, these are rife with racism. The state has to step in. The problem then is that identity politics wishes to destroy the very mediating institutions through which alone we can build a world of liberty.